Um, a presenter of our main talk today is a member of our community. She did an awesome community moment a few weeks ago, and uh, she approached me about a, a topic that sounded really fascinating to me, and a topic she's passionate about, and I'll let her share more about. Let's welcome Laura Whittington. So, uh, my presentation this morning is on Margaret Sanger and the very beginning of the American birth control movement. I'm not going to have time to cover the whole thing. <laughs> Uh, the inspiration for this main talk comes from my MFA thesis at the University of Texas at Austin, Great American Women and Their Hats. Uh, this thesis, ex thesis explored the contributions of specific women from U.S. history. A hat was designed and made for each woman based on research of her life as a sculptural representation of that woman. I made five hats. I asked five friends who were also costume technicians to make a hat as well and these were all donated to the National Women's History Museum in Washington, D.C. to be sold at their annual auction to raise funds for the museum building. So after I had sent everything off, the museum emailed me and said, oh no, where's that picture? That's a gorgeous photo of the hat my friend Christina made for, this. I didn't do this on purpose. <laughs> it was uh, a hat my friend Christina made uh, that represented Margaret Sanger. Um, and the museum told me they needed to send it back. Um, their reason was that Sanger was a very controversial figure, and since the museum was waiting for an upcoming congressional vote to move their building project forward, they did not want to be, to, they did not want to appear to be sympathetic to Sanger and her cause. And I was really confused. <laughs> because I didn't understand how birth control was so controversial. And just, you know, to even add to that confusion, uh, my mother, who was a Christian woman who was pro-life, did not, also did not understand why Margaret Sanger was a controversial theater, or controversial figure. Um, so both of us were very confused. So I began researching more about Sanger and looking further into what the anti-abortion movement says about her. Uh, it isn't flattering, <laughs> and while based in truth, it isn't entirely accurate. Search Margaret Sanger on Google, and the majority of what you will find will be doctored pictures and cherry-picked quotes. What I did not realize when I first sent that hat to the museum is that the anti-choice movement is actively spreading false or out-of-context information about Sanger. Their goal is to discredit her, and therefore discredit Planned Parenthood and the birth control movement entirely. And specifically, this quote here, more children from the fit, less from the infant fit, that is the chief aim of birth control. Margaret Sanger never said these words. These, they kept this quote because Margaret Sanger published several ma magazines with editorials on eugenics and birth control, and she did book reviews about books about these subjects, and this was a quote from one of the books that she reviewed and she disagreed with this book. But they still use this quote routinely when, dis when trying to criticize her. Um, this picture here is the real photograph. This picture here, uh, this is actually one of, if you do a Google image search of Margaret Sanger, you'll see this image a lot. And they've taken, obviously, this table, superimposed her on this, um, edited out the cross, added this sign right here, and made it look like a newspaper clipping from the 1920s. Now she did give a speech to a female group of clan members. She was invited to speak by them and she, whoever invited her to speak, she would go. It didn't matter. She didn't care who heard the message of birth control as long as people heard it. And they take this as, you see, she's talking to the clan because she's talking about controlling minority populations. No, she's talking to the Klan about the Klan controlling their population. <laughs> okay. She was a eugenist, which is true. An agnostic, also true. A racist, not true. An alcoholic, not true. She cheated on her husband, definitely true. <laughs> and her goal was to eliminate entire populations of people, also not true. The goal of this is to make people hate Sanger, and if people hate Sanger, they will stop using certain methods of contraception or seeking out abortions, which is flawless logic. 
<laughs> so today, I'm going to tell you the real story of Margaret Sanger and the American birth control movement and how the basic oppositions to Sanger and even birth control itself have not changed for over 100 years. The American birth rate in 1800 averaged, averaged at seven babies per woman. By 1900, it had decreased to 3.5 per woman. Now there's a side note in this. That was the national average. For wealthy women, it was more around like two babies per year. For poorer women, the number was larger. So obviously, Americans are doing something to reduce the amount of children they have, so how are they accomplishing it? Condoms had been around in some form since at least the 16th century. Before rubber, they were made of linen, animal intestine or animal skin, and female forms of contraception were sponges soaked in a homemade spermicide. However, the most popular form of family planning practiced in America in the 19th century was abortion, mainly because it was very easy to achieve compared to preventing conception in the first place. And at this time, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all considered abortion a lawful practice as long as it was done before the woman first felt the fetus move in her body. The favorable view of abortion began to change in the 1840s and the 1870s. However, the opposition was not based out of concern for the fetus. Contraception and abortion were seen as denying God's will and as a way that a woman could escape their God-given duty of having children. So even before Anthony Comstock went to Congress and created his law, public advertisements for contraceptive devices and abortion services were veiled in polite discreet and often euphemistic languages. Um, I pulled all of these images. Uh, if you go to the Library of Congress uh, website, you can search newspaper scans from, I believe it's 1822 to 1920 for all states. So this one right here, this is from New York, Illinois, and also New York. And Penny Royal was a big keyword. Women knew that this was an abortifacient and it was likely to work. Um, so, Anthony Comstock. Were it not for his law, Margaret's crusade to make contraception available to every couple would have been a lot easier. Comstock relocated to New York City from Connecticut shortly after the Civil War, and what he found there shocked him. Saloons were open at all hours cohabitating unmarried couples, prostitutes, erotic publications, all of it was available in New York City, and including contraception. And just like Rick Santorum, Comstock was convinced that the availability of contraception was what led to sexual promiscuity. And so in 1873, he went to lobby Congress to create a federal anti-obscenity law. In the lobby of the Capitol building, he set up a display of erotic publications, sex toys, and nude female dummies. He convinced Congress to pass his bill, now known as the Comstock Act. The enforcer of this act would be the United States Postal Service and Comstock himself, now a special agent of the post office. It was now an illegal and punishable offense to send through the mail or distribute erotica, sexual devices, contraceptive devices, abortifacients, or advice, even of a medical nature, about any of these topics. This law affected everyone, single people, married couples, and doctors consulting patients. Comstock returned to New York City and enthusiastically began enforcement of his law. He arrested the famous New York City abortionist, Madame Restell. He prevented anatomy textbooks from being distributed to medical students and he made it illegal for undressed mannequins to be left in store windows. <laughs> However, some doctors still distributed contraceptive information, but it was mainly the private doctors of the wealthy. Doctors that served the poor in public clinics or hospitals were unable, were under much more heavy surveillance. And now contraceptive devices and consultation were limited to women who could afford a private doctor or a trip to Europe where contraceptive devices were readily available. So, into all of this, Margaret Sanger was born, Mar Margaret Higgins, in Corning, New York, in 1879, to Irish immigrant parents. Margaret's mother, Anne, was pregnant 18 times in her 30-year marriage. 
Seven of these pregnancies ended in miscarriage. At the age of 50, her mother died of tuberculosis, and no doubt, exhaustion from 18 pregnancies and caring for 11 children. Politically and philosophically, Margaret took after her father, Michael. He was a vocal atheist and a union sympathizer, and this made him an outcast in Corning, which was a majority Catholic town. He lost work due to his beliefs. Because of her father, Margaret had the opportunity as a young girl to hear the noted agnostic Robert Ingersoll speak. Uh, Michael Higgins was the one who invited him to Corning for a lecture. So once Margaret finished her basic education, Margaret went to nursing school at White Plains Hospital in New York. And this is her in her uniform at White Plains. <coughs> uh, she was interested in maternity care and the emerging field of gynecology. Margaret excelled at White Plains, and she was promoted to head nurse in her ward. But in 1901, more than a year after entering school, Margaret met Bill Sanger, a young architect at a dance. And Bill began to encourage Margaret to give up her studies and her dreams of a career so she could marry him. Six months after their first meeting, Bill showed up at the White Plains Hospital with a carriage and wedding plans. Margaret got in the carriage, and as they drove around the city, Bill wore her down. He gave her an ultimatum, marry me now or never. They were married. Margaret returned to the hospital that day, and to Bill's surprise, attempted to keep the union a secret. Because at that time, if uh, the people that she worked with and went to school with found out she was married, she could be expelled from school. Eventually, Margaret left White Plains, months before graduation. In 1910, after Margaret and Bill had three children, Bill became tired of his architect career. He wanted to be a painter. So soon the Sangers could not afford their house in Hastings. They relocated to New York City, where a family of five could live much cheaper in an apartment. But they were still short of funds. So even though she had not completely finished her education, Margaret went back to work as a nurse to support her family, and she continued in her area of expertise. Childbirth and injuries sustained during childbirth. She served mainly the community of poor immigrant women who lived on the Lower East Side, and it was serving in this capacity that Margaret realized the dire need for birth control access for poor women. It is important to note here that the right-wing anti-abortion movement uses Margaret's desire to work outside the home and her rocky marriage with Bill uh, as a way to discredit her. They make no mention that Bill Sanger's decision to leave a lucrative career to made two incomes necessary for the Sanger family to continue to eat. And they also make no mention that Margaret, even though she did care for Bill, was coerced into marriage and forced to leave a profession that she had a natural talent for and that she was very passionate about. In the summer of 1912, Margaret is called with a doctor to attend Sadie Sachs, a poor 28-year-old married woman and already the mother of three. Sadie was suffering from an infection that was caused by a back alley abortion. She had paid $5 for this abortion, which is the equivalent today of about $120. While being treated, Sadie asked the doctor how she could prevent another pregnancy. Margaret remembered the doctor's response. Quote, you want your cake while you eat it too. Well, it can't be done. I tell you the only sure thing to do. Tell Jake to sleep on the roof. <laughs> a few months later, Margaret would be called back to Sadie's apartment. She had become pregnant again, and this time not having five dollars, had attempted to self-abort. This time, Margaret could do nothing for her. Sadie died of septicemia, or blood poisoning, widowing Jake and leaving her three children motherless. And this was a sad, common chain of events for families in the Lower East Side. Leaving the Sachs apartment on Grand Street, Margaret walked back to her own apartment on 135th Street. This is a long walk that would take her several hours. She covered almost the entire length of Manhattan in the early dark morning hours, all the while thinking about Sadie, her extreme poverty, and the children of the Lower East Side that were born into poverty, wrapped in newspapers instead of blankets, who went to work in factories to support their families instead of going to school, and it was all very common. 
and it was because their parents were poor. And the women in these families, knowing that they could not afford to care for one more child, desperate to prevent another pregnancy, and denied the means because their poverty and the law prevented it. By the time she arrived at 135th Street and the sun began to rise, she had vowed to do all she could to give these women birth control. Her first step was writing. The Women Rebel was published in 1914, and no practical advice about how to acquire or use contraception was in this publication, but she did mention that contraception was a thing and that there were ways to prevent pregnancy. She challenged the myth that contraception led to promiscuity, sterilization, and insanity. <laughs> and most inflammatory of all is that she separated sex from reproduction, advocating that sex could also be a pleasurable activity that need not end in pregnancy. And for this publication, Margaret was arrested and charged with four counts of violating the Comstock law. She pled not guilty. Before her arrest, though, Margaret had begun a new pamphlet called Family Limitation that went into great detail about every known method of contraception. It also included drawings and descriptions of the human reproductive organs and how they functioned in very plain language. She explained the difference between contraception and abortion, as most Americans conflated these two things. So much like many Americans today confuse the morning after pill, IUDs, and some forms of oral contraception with abortion, early 20th century Americans did not know the difference between ending a pregnancy and preventing a pregnancy. Margaret felt that this work, with its plain and direct language, was much more worthy of a prison sentence than the women rebel. <laughs> and although she did not fear prison, she knew that she had only just begun her mission to make contraception available and legal for every American family. A jail term now may stop her movement as it was just getting off the ground, and so she deliberated whether or not to acquiesce to a trial and possible sentencing. Quote, Shall I follow the inevitable suggestion of the I told you so's and take my medicine? Yes, but what medicine? I would swallow a dosage for the wrong disease. If I must go to jail, I will give them something to send me in on. <laughs> <laughs> and so in October of 1914, Margaret became a fugitive. She went to, a Canada, she went to Canada and acquired fake papers and assumed an alias. From there, she sailed to England. And once safely at sea, she, and I love this move, <laughs> she cabled back to friends in New York City who released thousands of copies of family limitation that Margaret had printed into circulation. <laughs> this was the kickoff to a year of intense study. First in England, she studied at the British Museum with Havelock Ellis. Uh, he was a doctor whose specialty was human sexuality and population control and he would pile texts that he had hand-selected from the museum's library onto Margaret's desk, creating for her a perfect course in population control, sexuality, contraception, and yes, eugenics, which is the nasty E word that everybody loves to just stamp on Margaret's forehead. Um, and it is somewhat accurate, but what the anti-choice movement chooses to ignore is that eugenics was extremely popular in America in the early 19th, early, in the late 19th and early 20th century. This pseudoscience movement believed that you could improve the human race and eliminate disease through selective breeding, much like racehorses and show dogs are bred. And Sanger was actually much more mild and compassionate in her eugenics than others, like Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, or many state legislatures. These advocated forced sterilization of the unfit and feeble-minded, and their category of the unfit was very wide. It included criminals, the mentally ill, epileptics, anyone who had a disease such as tuberculosis or cancer, even if it was in remission. Um, and by 1937, two-thirds of US states had laws on the books that made it completely legal to forcibly sterilize people, and the US Supreme Court had founded a constitutional practice. 
The idea of race suicide was also popular among many eugenists, and this was the belief that a white woman should have as many babies as they possibly could, and that minority populations and immigrants should have few or no children. Its fiercest advocate was Teddy Roosevelt, because he feared that one day minorities like blacks and immigrants would take over the country. And this is actually very similar to the beliefs of the modern quiverful movement, only they are religiously motivated instead of racially motivated. Large families are encouraged in evangelical Christian communities so that they can one day achieve a majority voting block that will put leaders in place to create laws based on the Bible. But Sanger found forced sterilization and eugenics based on race repulsive. She believed that the best way to ensure that families have healthy children was to leave the decision of how many children to have up to the mother, regardless of her race. As a eugenicist, she believed that before potential parents had children, they needed to evaluate their own health and think about what traits they would be passing on. However, and this is very important, she never encouraged the idea that the government should intercede in anyone's family planning. It would not make any sense for a woman who came from Irish immigrant parents and suffered from tuberculosis herself to subscribe to the idea of race suicide. After her time in England, Margaret went to the Netherlands, which at the time had the lowest infant mortality rate. Birth control was legal there and widely used. Margaret would go on to model her future birth control clinics after the Dutch clinics she toured. While there, she also interviewed a few doctors, and they taught her that because the sizes of women's cervixes varied, an examination and a fitting was vital before providing a woman with a pessiary or diaphragm. And before leaving, Margaret learned how to fit women for contraceptive devices. And so about a year later, she returned to a changed New York. In her absence, Bill had been arrested for distributing copies of Family Limitation. He had been tried, served his own defense, and spent a month in jail for his crime. The trial had put family limitation and birth control in the news. Comstock had died weeks after Bill's trial and just before Margaret returned. As she disembarked from her ship, the first magazine she saw on a newsstand bore the headline, What Shall We Do About Birth Control? But just before she was to go back to court, her youngest child, Peggy, who was five, died of pneumonia. After days of herself and her sister tending to Peggy, she died in Margaret's arms. And out of sympathy, her trial was postponed yet again. And eventually, the charges against her were dropped because the New York District Attorney did not want to make a martyr out of Margaret. The charges were well over a year old, and it would make the state look very callous to imprison a woman who had just lost a child. But this was also a sign that public opinion was turning in her favor. Margaret's next big project was to open the country's first birth control clinic in Brooklyn. In the weeks leading up to the clinic's opening, she posted these placards at local stations that gave out milk to Brooklyn's needy. They read, Mothers, can you afford to have a family? Do you want any more children? If not, why do you have them? Do not kill, do not take life, but prevent. The clinic opened on October 16th of 1916. Each client paid a 10 cent fee, answered questions about their birthing history and income, and signed a waiver saying that they were married. In return, they received specific education and multiple birth control techniques about where to purchase and advice about where to purchase vaginal pessiaries and a lesson in how to them. On the first day, the clinic saw 100 women and 20 men. Ten days after the clinic opened, a well-dressed white woman came to the clinic with a baby and identified herself as Mrs. Whitehurst. She stood out among the other women in both appearance and demeanor. The receptionist, Fania Mendel, was suspicious of this woman and warned Margaret, but she still took her into the exam room and counseled her on birth control. Mrs. Whitehurst was an undercover policewoman, and the baby was even a prop borrowed for the occasion. She returned the next day with three officers who shut down the clinic, threatened the patients with subpoenas, and confiscated everything, from copies of Margaret's writing down to the furniture. Margaret, her sister Ethel, also a nurse, 
and Fanny and the receptionist were arrested. And when the police wagon arrived, Margaret refused to get in. She walked behind it a mile to the police station. They were all charged with violating the New York Penal Code, and Margaret, a second-time offender, was to be tried in a court of special sessions, where her fate would be determined by three judges instead of a jury, who lawmakers feared would be sympathetic to birth control. She pled not guilty on the grounds of freedom of speech, the fact that the Comstock laws were unconstitutional, and that birth control provided health benefits for women. Wanting to be helpful, the women who were in the clinic at the time of its raid testified that Margaret had given them useful information that they very much wanted to hear. Attempting to highlight the need for birth control, Margaret's lawyer asked them about their dismal living conditions, their large number of children, and their crowded apartments. The prosecution claimed that Margaret's intent in opening the clinic was to destroy the Jewish race and make a financial profit doing so. And these same accusations are made about the modern day Planned Parenthood, only they claim that the majority of clinics are set up in black neighborhoods to kill black babies and profit off of it. And this is false. Only 14% of Planned Parenthood's customers are African American, which is nearly equal to the percentage of African Americans in the United States. And these kinds of statements are also offensive to Jewish women, of the Jewish women of 1916 and the black women of today. This kind of thinking assumes that minority women are not intelligent enough to understand what birth control is and to make their own decisions about health care. The court offered Margaret a deal. Swear to stop her birth control campaign and her sentence would be suspended. She refused and was given a 30-day sentence in the Queens County Penitentiary. Four weeks after her release from prison, the United States entered World War I. And this war brought Americans' prudery to the front. Compared to other countries, American soldiers were more likely to contract venereal diseases because the government, assuming that all of their soldiers would remain chased overseas, did not issue them condoms. <laughs> After realizing this was an unrealistic expectation, uh, condoms in government publications about contraception and venereal disease were issued to soldiers. Exactly the kind of information that Sanger had been recently jailed for. Except, compared to Margaret's writing, the government pamphlets were even more graphic. Uh, in 1918, she was arrested again for selling writings about birth control, only this time, her legal team tried a new tactic. They compared her writing to the materials distributed by the U.S. government, and the charges were dropped. <laughs> even though her jail term for operating a clinic was over, Margaret continued to appeal this conviction. She argued that since the state did not coerce women into marriage, it had no right to force them into motherhood by denying them the right to contraception. Her conviction was not overturned, and this was a huge pivotal moment. This was the domino that set every single other law just fall, or set it up to fall. The New York Court of Appeals decided that doctors were now exempt from the Comstock Law when consulting patients on birth control. Because of time, we're going to have to stop here. <laughs> um, just know that at this point in the early 1920s, the groundwork had been laid that would eventually lead to the Supreme Court overturning laws that prevented access to birth control. And Margaret's ultimate goal, a magic pill that would allow women to turn their fertility on and off, would come in 1957, which she helped to create. And in 1966, the same year that this ad is from, actually, Margaret passed away. If you are interested and want to learn more, I recommend the book, Margaret Sanger, A Life of Passion, by Jean H. Baker, the PBS documentary, The Pill, and Linda Gordon's speech, Contraception at the Tea Party, The Politics of Women's Health. The latter two can be found on YouTube, and I will gladly post these links to the Oasis Facebook page. I also encourage you to talk about Sanger, especially since there is a campaign to dismiss Sanger and refute any arguments you hear to discredit her. Thank you.